Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sabobella Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you CRAMSurge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Welcome back everyone. A slightly shorter episode today. We're going to talk about a paper concerning the use of drains after incisional hernia repair. And uh, there will be a discussion concerning the paper itself, but no teaching session today. Lots of learning points from the paper discussions anyway, which I'm sure you'll find interesting. I'll leave you to it. My name's Anna, um, I'm currently a CT2 uh, in Sheffield um, and this evening with Geo we'll be going through a paper called Drain versus No Drain in Open Mesh Repair for Incisional Hernia Results of a Prospective Randomised Controlled Trial and this was done by a group in Switzerland and published this month in WJS. So just as a background, um, incisional hernias are obviously quite a common complication after abdominal surgery. Uh, and quite often they'll, uh, the patients will undergo an incisional hernia repair. In the UK, that's about uh, sort of 6,000 a year um, and 70 to 80% of those use a mesh uh, based on uh, from about three years ago and last year's physical offices. And um, most of these will be elective. In terms of complications of the repair, quite commonly they can include seroma and infection, and there's no definitive consensus opinion on drain use, um, but there was a court ruling in Australia a few years ago uh, that essentially mandated drain use in complex repairs. Um, so Gio will now talk a bit more about the research question. Yeah, so the research question the author set out to uh, find an answer for is, does leaving a drain post-incision of hernia repair reduce uh, post-operative complications? Now, uh, the authors go a little bit back and forth um, in their definition of null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis, but uh, what they highlight is basically the null hypothesis is that there is no difference between the two treatment. The alternative hypothesis is that there is a decreased complication rate in absence of a drain. So if we have to say this in a PICO format, uh, the population will be 20 to 80 years old um, patients, uh, residents in Switzerland uh, that are undergoing an elective open hernia mesh repair with an ASA between one and three, so they exclude ASA four or above. The intervention would be the absence of a drain, uh, the comparison or gold standard would be the drain. Um, two particularly, one placed in the um, retromuscular space and one in the subcutaneous space. Um, the outcome uh, is radiological, so it's uh, the evidence on ultrasound of a fluid collection at day 30 post-op, and a variety of secondary outcomes that we will uh, debunk as we go along. So uh, reading again uh, from the null hypothesis, you think that this trial is perhaps designed as a superiority trial. Um, however, the authors, again, don't clarify this very well, so I, I can't really say. Um, back to Anna for a bit more. Thanks, Gio. So if we go through the methods, um, it was a randomised multicentric uh, involving two hospitals uh, trial, and it wasn't blinded. Um, we've removed the word perspective uh, from this, because essentially all trials would be anyway, so it's a bit redundant. Uh, the exclusion criteria were a hernia defect of less than two centimetres, but they didn't have an upper limit. Uh, inguinal hernia, any ongoing antibiotic treatment before admission uh, or any immunosuppressive therapy, uh, and any emergency surgery for an incarcerated or strangulated hernia uh, or a laparoscopic hernia repair. Um, in their sample size calculations, um, they based this on a projection rate of 20% of 20% of patients with the drain having complications um, versus 10% uh, without. And on the basis of 80% power, they said they would have needed 398 patients. And their recruitment was um, just under 10 years uh, between October 2007 to January 2017. So back to show for the rest of the methods. 
Yeah, so the authors uh, do um, state in their methods that they standardize the type of repair that they're offering patients, um, which they describe simply as a reef stop repair with a retromuscular mesh uh, positioning. They, however, do not standardize the type of mesh they're using, which if you recall from a few episodes um, a go does have quite an influence in terms particularly of recurrence rates, but uh, also local complications. Um, they do standardize their displacement, as mentioned. So one is placed basically below where, where the mesh is and one is placed uh, above the fascia and below the skin. And they take the drains out when the output reaches less than 30 mils um, a day. Um, we'll go back to this standardization and definitions a little bit later. The endpoint, uh, as mentioned, is at 30 days, uh, and as discussed, uh, they do look with an ultrasound whether there is or not a fluid collection in the spaces involved in the repair, which is not really something we do routinely unless we have a suspicion for a collection. Nevertheless, they then, then subclassify the type of collection identified as a seroma hematoma or abscess. However, the primary outcome is a composite of those three. Secondary outcomes are uh, complications, including early recurrence, surgical site infection, eviscerations, dacents, uh, which basically you could say are uh, surgical site occurrences, if you like. Uh, the presence of an ileus and a variety of medical complications that are measured with Clavendin door CCIs, which are pretty standard classification methods that we discussed uh, briefly before. Uh, on this forum. Um, so ball back to Anna for um, some results. Uh, so in terms of the enrollment, they had 168 patient they, patients that they assessed for eligibility. Um, there were 24 that were excluded, um, either because they declined to participate, um, the exclusion criteria or their consent went missing. So they were left with 144 that were randomised. Um, which is quite different from the 398 that they needed in their power calculation. But in any case, we'll come to that in a second. So of, of those 144, they had 70 allocated to drain, 74 to no drain. They didn't lose any to follow up, um, and they did it all as an intention to treat analysis. Um, now, they said that they terminated their recruitment early uh, because of difficulties with recruitment. Um, with the development of sort of minimally invasive and laparoscopic uh, repairs, um, but obviously that impacted numbers quite significantly. So, Gio, what do you think of uh, the next step of their results? Yeah, so this is a, a brief table summarizing the baseline characteristics of the two groups. Um, as you can see, they are uh, brief, sort of, sort of grossly comparable. Um, there is a slight tendency of having uh, more patients with diabetes in the no drain group, but there's a, a slightly a higher proportion of current smokers in the uh, drain group. Um, but nothing particularly reaches um, statistical significance. Um, I do take a few issues with some variables that are highlighted here. Certainly the hernia size. Uh, if you look at uh, the number of patients that had a hernia uh, bigger than 10 centimeters, you start wondering whether a reef stopper repair is actually sufficient for closing these defects without tension or whether an additional element to the repair should actually be used, uh, such as an anterior component separation or a transversus ab abdominis release. Um, we don't really know the exact size of this or whether a volumetric sort of assessment was undertaken pre-op. Nevertheless, uh, it makes me wonder. Uh, and certainly the number of recurrent hernias, almost regardless by the size that are treated without a specific degree of imaging pre-op, it's reasonably high. Um, right, ball back to you, uh, Anna, for a bit more results. So if we then move on to looking um, at the primary outcome, so this was the presence of a collection on ultrasound on post-op day 30, um, there wasn't a statistically significant difference, um, even on sort of the hernia defect size breakdown. Um, but the main sort of issue here is that they didn't particularly comment on whether this collection was symptomatic at all um, or clinically significant. Um, they have quite a high rate of uh, collection with 60%, but how many of these were clinically relevant isn't commented on uh, at all. Um, so it's tricky to kind of then interpret um, the kind of real world use. Uh, and then if we move on to the secondary outcome or the start of them, 
uh, in terms of the complications. They had fewer complications uh, in the drain group, um, particularly in the wound dehiscence. Um, but again, it's not clear if there's any other sort of compounding issues, for example, was it more so in, for example, the over 10 centimetres uh, defect group, because um, there might have been issues with soft tissue coverage uh, and also you know, the effects on potentially exposing the mesh. Um, and they didn't really elaborate on how significant sort of major this dehiscence was. Um, so GA will take us through the rest of the secondary outcomes. Yeah, a few a few little notes um, here. Um, as you can see, the authors um, digged a little bit deeper into surgical site infections, rates uh, and size and locations. And as you can see, um, there's no particular difference between the two groups in terms of SSIs. Um, and if you scroll through the Clavian Dindo and the Comprehensive Complication Index, again, there are some slight differences. Um, but nothing that would really uh, sort of shout or, uh, um, or or makes me jump to think that one approach is particularly better than the other. So certainly this is exploratory data. So even the interpretation is probably subject to a little bit of uh, um, sort of think through. Uh, Bob, back to you, Anna. Thanks. So when we looked at the limitations of the study, um, the ones that the authors reported themselves um, only really included that uh, it was terminated early uh, and also that it wasn't uh, blinded, which they said wouldn't have been feasible because of the nature of the intervention of the drain. Um, although I wonder whether they would have been able to, for example, sort of stick a drain tube under a dressing to give at least sort of the impression of that, if that would have been sufficient uh, sort of blinding from the patient's head or not. Um, Gio, what do you think of the other limitations? Yeah, we've listed a few points that we... Uh, thought about as we were reading through this. Um, the randomization method, uh, well, they they don't specify whether they use blocks or not, and certainly they did not use any stratification. Um, this is a multi-center trial with two centers. Uh, the authors that originally designed the trial uh, come from the main uh, center of the two. Uh, but they calculated that it would take them so long to do the study if they had been alone that they involved another hospital. Uh, couldn't really work out what expertise in the other hospital was available uh, for repairing these hernias, particularly when they're complex. Um, the incision of hernia site, you presume, looking at the data set and, and what they presented, that these are all midline incision of hernias, but they never specify that. Could have been a sort of midline defect from a previous um, open cholecystectomy or a midline defect on a um, it's It's really hard to say. Um, the peri perioperative workout is not really standardized. Uh, and I couldn't really work out how many of these patients had a preoperative CT, uh, how many had a, a volumetric assessment performed, which, you know, there's quite a few uh, methods to calculate that in a standardized way uh, available in the literature. Um, Given how many patients have a midline laparotomy and end up with the stomas, I must assume that there, there were some stoma patients in this group, um, but the presence of stomas is not, presence or absence of stomas is not really clarified. As we discussed already, uh, not standardizing or recording the type of mesh you're using uh, does obviously affect somehow the results um, for the patients, particularly in the longer run. And I cannot stress enough, I, would do, I do think that the primary endpoint is externally not valid. Um, I personally would not routinely image um, a repair unless I think that there is something wrong with it or that needs draining. Um, in this case, um, everything is scanned. And I think this does have a consequence in terms of the um, frequency of the primary outcome, they start thinking, well, we'll have a 20% uh, complication rate versus a 10% complication rate in absence of a drain, and then they end up with 60% in both groups. There is something that they were not calculating properly at the start, I think. Um, we already touched on the fact that I don't think Reevestop is necessarily at the appropriate sort of repair for a hernia bigger than 10 centimeter. Um, the authors do mentioned across the methods the presence of a fascia release as appropriate but they don't specify what that actually means so i can't really elaborate or how often they actually did it so 
hard to say. Uh, and right, uh, ball back to Ama for uh, some conclusions. Thanks, Gio. Um, so overall, our bottom line was that drains don't seem to change the collection rate, at least radiologically. Um, although, as we've discussed, we don't really know their clinical significance. Um, but we wondered whether this wound dehiscence uh, difference with the drain needed further investigation. Uh, we've got our summary table here uh, with sort of the pros and cons um, of the study as a whole. And we've mentioned our concerns about sort of the external validity, especially in the primary outcome. We discuss a few further points um, after the presentation itself, starting for, from the appropriateness of the primary outcome. As you recall from the presentation, we did not find the primary outcome particularly externally valid. Um, however, there is a point to be made about uh, the difference between an efficacy and an effectiveness trial, whereby an outcome of this kind could be considered for an efficacy type trial, whereby we could simply determine whether the absence of a drain does reduce the presence of a collection regardless on the ultimate desired result, which would be a reduction in uh, surgical site occurrences. To make some sense, however, uh, there would need to be a relationship, uh, at least at a biological level, between the presence of a collection and surgical site occurrences. We went then on to reiterate a few points concerning the relevance of the comments the authors make about the recruitment difficulties they had when it is then essential to ask ourselves what is the denominator and how many incision hernias were actually repaired in the overall period of time, uh, which is again 10 years, which is quite long. Furthermore, uh, if you think about the uh, importance of laparoscopic repair and uh, what types of hernias this is applicable to, uh, you can't help thinking whether it's not just the frequency of the intervention that has changed, but also the patients that are subject to that intervention as especially at the start of the learning curve one might choose to do an IPOM on a relatively simple case before taking away the simpler cases from the trial leaving only rather large incision hernias which we already discussed are perhaps not suitable for the type of repair that these authors are um, using. We're going to write to the authors with uh, this point and a few more and we keep you posted. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.